You're listening to The Dead Prussian, a podcast about war and warfare. So there's this Greek guy that a lot of people study when they talk about war, and uh, I've studied him this year. Um, I've got the big uh, landmark version of his book, and of course I'm talking about Thucydides. Now, you may have heard of him through study, uh, through someone sitting around talking about how they know a lot about Thucydides, and they probably don't, or reading some of the popular discussion at the moment about how China is Athens and the US is Sparta, even though if you look at it closely, the US is probably a lot closer to Athens and China's a lot closer to Sparta and yeah, you know, it can be a misapplied analogy. However, I'm not talking about uh, the Thucydides trap today. In fact, I've already talked about the Thucydides trap on a different show you should listen to. G'day listeners, it is Mick, your host here of the Dead Prussian Podcast. Welcome back and thank you for all your support. The iTunes reviews are great to see and uh, there's been a little bit of merchandise uh, flying out the door, which is good. Today I want to talk about using the Greek bloke, Thucydides, uh, who's not a Prussian at all, he predates the Prussian by quite some time. Uh, But today I want to talk about how people can understand the experience of war ethics and morality in war from reading uh, this old bloke's old text. Now, of course, he wrote about the Peloponnesian War, which was back in the day. That's right, back in the day. That's the era around when Thucydides was about. Now, to do this, it's not just going to be me sitting and waxing lyrical on the microphone as much as I would love that, but I've got myself a really good guest. My guest today is Dr. Pauline shanks Corinne. Pauline is an academically trained philosopher and ethicist. She's interested in military ethics, business ethics, applying ethical thinking to policy questions. She's currently an Associate Professor of Philosophy, the Chair of the Department of Philosophy at the Pacific Lutheran University. She's the author of The Warrior, Military Ethics and Contemporary Warfare, Achilles Goes Asymmetrical, love that title. Uh, That was published by Ashgate in 2014. You can follow her on Twitter via at Queen of Thin Air, and most importantly, right now she's teaching a course on the experience of war using the Sydney's. Pauline, thanks very much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Mac. Now, you're a repeat offender on the show, so that's really good because it means that we get to have a bit of fun <laughs> with the last question. Yeah. But before we start doing that, there may be people that didn't listen uh, to our ethics panel. So if you haven't listened to the ethics panel uh, with uh, retired Lieutenant General uh, James Dubik, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Tom McDermott from the Australian Army and Pauline, it's, uh, it was a cracker of a, uh, a chat and uh, go back through our episode catalogue and listen to it. Uh, you'll learn a lot. I certainly did. But we're not here to talk That's about... Your homework. Yeah, that's right. Everyone should do their homework. Um, you're definitely a teacher. Um, so, Pauline, before we start talking about the utility of old Greek blokes um, in modern studies of war, morality, ethics, and uh, generally just war experiences, I, I, I'm keen for everyone to learn a little bit more about how you got into this field. Uh, the field of military ethics? Yeah, military ethics, and yeah, let's go with that. Okay. Uh, so, my dad was. Uh, in the U.S. Air Force, and he was what uh, we call a missile jockey. He went um, and would go down into the missile silos and fix the warheads if they were broken. He also worked on the trucks that transport uh, the warheads. So, And I grew up during Vietnam, so I grew up arguing with my father about the efficacy of air power, which if you know anything about Air Force gentlemen... That is holy gospel. So that's yeah. where I learned to argue, and that's how I got interested. Um, got interested in war initially, um, but in college I was a philosophy and international relations major, but they never really sort of fit together. Um, and I eventually ended up spending some time in D.C. and then deciding to go to graduate school in philosophy. And in grad school I took a course from Sidney Axon, who's a Kantian, but he wrote a book called Moral Military. So that's sort of how I got interested in military ethics. That's sort of where my two interests uh, finally came together and sort of made sense. 
I just like the term missile jockey because uh, I've got the scene <laughs> from uh, Doctor Strange Love or How I Learned to Love the Bomb in my mind, but that's yeah, actually that's yeah. actually not a missile though. So all the technical uh, Air Force guys will really hate it if I call that a missile. So I'll pro- <laughs> no, I'll prob- that's the term we use in our family. My mother used that term. <laughs> I think it's awesome. Now you're currently teaching. A, uh, a course called the experience of war so let's begin with that because this is actually um, something I spotted on Twitter and I straight away said right you got to come on the show because um, <laughs> you're incorporating uh, Thucydides and his history of the Peloponnesian Wars into the learning outcomes for your students on the experience of war how, how exactly does Thucydides fit into what you're teaching uh, the Experience of War is part of our honors um, program, which is a general education uh, program. So my course is one of the humanities classes. And so Thucydides does a couple of things. First, one of the main aims of the class is for them to empathetically engage as well as intellectually engage the experience of war across time and space. In order to do that, you have to study actual wars. And so the class goes in chronological order. So Thucydides seems like a good place to start. I've been teaching Thucydides for about 10 years. And I used to do uh, Donald Kagan's uh, The Origins on the Origins of War and the Preservation of Peace. And one of the chapters is the Peloponnesian War. But being a philosopher, I have a uh, a bias, you might say, for primary sources. So eventually I just decided to make them read Thucydides. I thought this would be a great idea. <laughs> um, so that's sort of one piece. The other piece is that Thucydides is really nice because he sets up a lot of the themes of the course. So the, the tension, or the conflict between the realist point of view and a just war point of view, various kinds of ethical issues like how do you treat the enemy, what's the effect of war on the home front. Um, Last week we talked about the problem of of fear and preventative war. So it sets up a lot of the, you know, the themes that we're going to explore later in the course. And it's also a classic and difficult text. So it, you know, develops reading abilities and uh, an ability to work through a large amount of material and pull out what they want to discuss and to motivate discussion um, from them. So this isn't me deciding what we're going to talk about, although I have a few things I like to talk about, but it's really, it's motivated by what they think is interesting and what they talk about. It sounds sounds like a really cool course, Um, much much cooler than... uh studying the cities just to learn about strategy which i'm not saying is something i spent uh, a couple of months doing at the start of the year on my current uh, course but hey if the shoe fits now yeah you said you said this is an honors course and it's about um not just intellectually engaging but um empathetically engaging with the materials so how have your students responded to studying the cities to draw out these different viewpoints on war well, part of it is just that, that it's overwhelming and it's a difficult text. So we've had to talk about how you read differently. But then we also start with, I actually start with, so what were your emotional reactions to the text? Which is not usually like how you think a philosopher is going to start the discussion. Yeah. And so we actually start by emoting, which they're not really comfortable with, but which is a really important place to start so that you can move through thinking about your emotive responses and and why you have those and what biases or suppositions or commitments are under those biases to move to more intellectual analysis. So last week they were really annoyed that Thucydides spent so much time on all these speeches. So we ended up talking about political rhetoric and the role of rhetoric in Greek society and how does that compare to the role of rhetoric in our society and ended up discussing a comparison between Donald Trump's rhetoric style and Barack Obama's rhetoric style. So, I mean, you sort of start with these emotive pieces and then you dig in and unpack those and think about how our reactions to things are conditioned less by what Thucydides is saying but more by our own context and what we're reading into Thucydides or how we're reacting to what he has to say in the 
the way in which he approaches things. He's a, I guess you could say he's a historian. I take him to be a historian or yeah. constructing a narrative. So, so that's interesting as well to look at the text sort of from that point of view, because this class also looks at things from the from variety of disciplines, mainly the disciplines in the humanities, so philosophy, religion, uh, literature, languages, um, and and for our purposes, I consider history as a humanities uh, discipline as well. So you're looking at things from the the standpoint of how do different disciplines look at knowledge? What questions do they ask? What kinds of things do they pursue? It sounds like a like a, having read uh, the Peloponnesian Wars once as a teenager because I thought it was going to be a really cool story about Greeks uh, kicking each other's butts and uh, struggling through it <laughs> and then having to go through books one and two with a fine-tooth comb uh, this year. It sounds like it's a really fun sort of way of exploring the course. Um, just for those of my instructors that start this year, I, would, I too would have liked to have talked about my feelings. But, yes. <laughs> but uh, it, I mean, he's key at the moment in terms of discussing uh, a lot of international relations issues here. Sure. And so he's, he's quite popular, I guess. But um, what yeah. what what has been sort of the key um, lessons, I suppose, that your students have sort of uh, you think for understanding, you know, morality and ethics of war. Um, well, I mean, so far we're about, so we're about halfway through uh, the book. And I think so far what they've focused on, aside, we mentioned, I mentioned the idea of political rhetoric, you know, the question of what causes war and whether war is inevitable. I mean, my students really, especially a couple of them have really bristled at the idea that somehow war is ever inevitable. So we've, spent a lot of time talking about that. The question of, you know, the role of fear and going to war maybe before you really need to because you're worried about what the other side is going to do. And in that, we've talked a lot about uh, what I call the epistemological problem. That is, you're trying to interpret what your adversary is, is thinking and doing, and they're trying to do the same. And that's always very dicey. Um, because frequently we're wrong about that. Yeah. So that's that's been interesting. The other issue that came up was is uh, to what degree, especially in a democracy, uh, do ethics change and erode as as war begins and then as it goes on. I think a theme in Thucydides is that the longer the war goes on, sort of the the worse it is for society. The more willing people are willing to. Uh, slide, if you will, on their ethical commitments or change them altogether out of the sense of, of fear and necessity. So we ended up, that's sort of where we ended last week, was was talking about that issue and students were making connections to, um, you know, the political environment post 9-11 because yeah. last week was, was 9-11. And so so that was interesting as well. I mean, those, some, those are some of the kinds of things that we... Um, that we end up talking about. And uh, I guess, you know, the, the Peloponnesian Wall was about 30 years uh, in length, and uh, I suppose some of your students have probably grown up uh, for a fair part of their lives having uh, spent under the shadow of the Long War, the, the West, and uh, terrorist organisations currently engaged in at the moment. So did you find them relating to any specific uh, incidences within... Um, Within the work, I mean, you would have covered the the Melian dialogue at the moment, which is is not about eating food. People, the Melian dialogue, something a bit different. <laughs> um, but is there any is there any sort of little bit of text that just really jumped out and caused a bit of friction in the group, or or worth discussing? Um, yeah. So we'll be doing the Melian dialogue today. So we haven't awesome. quite got that far yet. Um, but they really they were really focused on 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 the speeches and. Uh, why people were spending so much time like arguing and trying to persuade one another. Some students really did think that war was inevitable and yeah. that the speeches were sort of just window dressing. Um, and other people thought that the role of speeches was actually to persuade and that people hadn't made up their minds yet. And so if the rhetoric had been approached in a different kind of way, could there have been things that could have been appealed to 
that weren't appealed to in the speeches, um, that that could have changed the, the the course of war. And students found did find it interesting how 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 these smaller countries are or these smaller city states are really sort of spoiling for a fight in Athens and Sparta. <laughs> really, really aren't excited to, to sort of go, but yeah. they end up being drawn in. And so that is something that they did connect to the long war. I mean, most of my students were, and it pains me to say this, in kindergarten or younger when 9-11 happened. <laughs> so they have a very different sort of perspective. In comparison, I was a new, a relatively new faculty member at Pelio. I was in my <laughs> third year um, when 9-11 happened. Um, and the next day had to go in to teach um, a writing course on warriors. So uh, so they have a very sort of different framework and they have many, you know, friends and uh, especially friends, but brothers and sisters who are now in the military. So uh, I think that, you know, that is changing their perspective a bit. So I think they were frustrated, many students, with this idea that somehow war is part of human nature that's inevitable. So there was a lot of pushback on that. So I'm not sure how many good Hobbesians we have in the room. <laughs> we'll find out <laughs> soon. That, that, that's really tough, uh, knowing how old you're, or young your students are. Because yeah. you know, 9-11 was my first year at the military academy, and uh, there and now I think uh, students going through uh, the military academy that were born in the same year as 9-11. So... Um, yeah. that, that, that's a bit scary, but, um, uh, it's also good to see that people identify that, um, the whole war was Corinth's fault. Um, so any future yeah. students out there, you can quote me on this, blame Corinth. They are really spoiling for a fight. Although Athens, <laughs> Athens in their great fear, honor and interest speech, they don't really say, Hey, um, let's not fight. They just say, Hey, if you bring it, we're going to bring it. Um, yeah. it, it's good. It's good to hear, um, that this stuff is engaging with them and the, the speeches in there are not necessarily the policies themselves but the articulation of the policies. Um, but how else would you get you know, young people engaged with such exciting stuff as policy, uh, you know, international <laughs> relations, all this sort of stuff without raising like an old uh, Greek text? Uh, it would be really cool if you're making them read it on papyrus. Yeah. <laughs> So my next point, uh, there may be a lot of people who are either involved in the education training or uh, general, especially professional military education, but uh, professional development space that may be interested in using uh, these types of texts or even just incorporating the cities into educating their students and colleagues on morality, experiences, ethics um, to do with conflict. Um, what sort of advice would you give to them? Because it sounds like you've managed to engage a heap of young people with some ancient Greek text. So that's quite an achievement. Um, yeah, I think if you're doing professional military education, obviously the dynamic is different um, and the focus would be different. I mean, we're not spending a lot of time on necessarily thinking about about strategy, except the intersection of strategy and ethics, which, as you know, I'm interested in. Um, we're not spending a lot of time on the sort of more technical descriptions of, of combat and battles and, and that kind of thing. Um, I do think that there's certain sections from the, from the text, whether that's the speeches, the Malian dialogue, or later in the book, discussions of how uh, different parties are treating their adversaries, the question of prisoners of war, the question of, you know, do, do you, when people have rebelled, do you, do you just, do you, do you execute them all this question of collective uh, guilt? Um, and do you have to do that? Do you have to treat your adversary very roughly to, I call this the Sherman thesis to shorten the <laughs> war. Um, and that's after, Sherman's little trek through the, the American <laughs> South. Yes. So, I mean, I think those are questions that, that are interesting to people who uh, have been there and done that. None of my students have been in combat. Yeah. Um, this year, none of them in our, are in ROTC. Last year, I had one ROTC cadet. So yeah. I think it's about, as in all my teaching, I think it's about starting from what your students' experiences are and making use of those experiences and, and then letting that drive what they find interesting. Um, 
kind of out of the text because like all great text, there's just so much there and you can only do so much. So I think you have to decide, you know, what's going to engage students and what's really important for whatever purpose they're, they're thinking about. I know the war colleges, they read it from the standpoint of strategy. I think as an ethicist that there are a lot of really interesting sort of ethical issues, issues around uh, how do you manage alliances, especially when some of your allies are sort of snotty and spoiling for a fight. I mean, <laughs> there's right. all kinds of, of really interesting issues. How do you manage um, the morale back home? So last week we looked at, one of the things we looked at was Pericles' famous funeral oration. Yeah. Um, and sort of what's the what's the point of that and the idea of Athenian exceptionalism that he's articulating there and how does that compare to American exceptionalism. So, I mean, I think you kind of take where your students are and, and, and what their experiences are and, and then figure out what's, what's going to be most interesting or most engaging. And usually they'll tell you my students are, <laughs> you know, <laughs> very happy to let me know what they think is interesting. That's the point of the emotive, the emoting at the beginning is that's where you find out what they liked, what they didn't like, what they're reacting to. And I'm guessing that that emotive process would be very different at, let's say, the Army War College here. Yeah, yeah. I might um, I might talk to some of my colleagues just I might, tomorrow. I might just go into class and ask people if they want to emote with me and see how we go. <laughs> they probably look at you like you're insane. My students look at me like I'm insane. They're like, have you lost your mind? But, <laughs> you know. Oh, that's good. It's it's good to see a little bit of emoting in the classroom. Um, it, it can go a long way. Now, for those yeah. uh, those listeners that don't know, uh, at Pericles' funeral oration, it's not his funeral. That's something I learned because it'd be very it's a hard, yeah. really hard <laughs> to speak at your own funeral. But uh, it's not it his be. funeral. Look, Pauline, we could talk all day uh, about ancient Greek, not in ancient Greek, because I don't know ancient Greek, but. We do have a time limit, and that's generally how long uh, my listeners are on the treadmill or in the uh, stuck in the beltway for. So it's probably time to move on to the final question. Now, the final question is one you've answered before, so you can't give the same answer as you gave before. And I was, but I got really lazy. I was going to look up your last answer, but I, I couldn't find it because I, I didn't look because it's 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and when it's 2 a.m., some things uh, you can let slide. But uh, So you could actually probably trick me, so that's okay. As you know, the mission on this show stems from uh, Big Carl uh, Clausewitz himself, the Dead Prussian, and uh, his first chapter in uh, his book on war, um, trying to define what is war, and uh, continue the debate and discussion around war because it's such an important topic that affects society in so many different ways. So I'm going to ask you to finish the sentence, war is. So, Pauline, war is... Uh, fashion by other means. Fashion Which by other means. I know means. sounds weird and stereotypical female. Actually, I didn't look up my prior response, which I think was probably sort of fairly standard. Yeah. Um, but I figured that it's rude to do the same thing twice. So, yeah. and I've really been, I've been thinking about the idea of fashion. So this question is what we do the first day of class. My students have to define a uh, war. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I'm thinking in terms of that fashion is a way that we project power. We project image. We project authority. I'm a big fan of, of high heels. Uh, so that's one way to sort of project power and authority or beauty. Yeah. Uh, fashion changes every year. We have new collections every year. Uh, there's new and creative and innovative and sometimes weird things that we see coming down the fashion runway. But then there are certain things that always seem to endure. Or they come back around the, the tuxedo, the little back, black dress. There's certain kinds of yeah. things. And we talk about the, you know, does, does the, the nature of war change? Does the character of war change? Um, and then also war, I mean, there is this important place for uh, creativity. And I think war rewards creativity. And uh, I know people don't like the term innovation, so I won't use that. But oh, I like the idea of critical thinking or, or creativity that you, you know, you read the history of, of warfare. What, what you find is that people try to do the same thing 
uh, that they've done before and it doesn't work. And so they have to, they have to change. They have to invent on the fly. Um, but then also, I guess the last thing I would say is that like fashion, sometimes war is just, it's just weird. Right? <laughs> and I think that's something my students find reading all of these books that we read on, on the experience of war is that some of it just seems very odd and, and alien to them, that there's just stuff that happens in war that you're scratching your head and saying, what? Why? Why? Yeah. What are you doing? This is the same reaction I have when I watch some of the models walk down the runway and say, why? Why? No, I'm not going to wear that. So so that's my definition. War is fashion by other means. That is uh, that is brilliantly original, um, which is also popular <laughs> in fashion. Um, war is fashion by other means. I, uh, I love it just like I love a good set of heels, but we won't talk about my uh, private life while we're on the show. Now, for the listeners out there, you can grab Pauline's book uh, anywhere that sells really, really good books. Um, you can definitely get it on Amazon. You can get it on a Book Depository and Booktopia. Uh, it's called The Warrior, Military Ethics in Contemporary Warfare. Achilles Goes Asymmetrical. Still always going to love that title. And for anyone who's a student <laughs> up in the Pacific Lutheran University in the US and you've got an honours thing coming up, uh, hey, maybe we can just take the course. And then, then you can... <laughs> reference this this show which would be kind of cool in the classroom that would be you also find pauline on uh twitter at queen of thin air that's actually how we decided to do the interview because we we're discussing this class on twitter so if you're not on the twitter sphere get on the twitter sphere you don't necessarily have to uh, dip your toe in the pond just watch the water the surface of the water for a while um, but you can find some great discussions on there and uh, this the Thursday's one was uh, really good fun, got me through uh, one of my lectures uh, that I was definitely paying attention to at the time. Got to love economics. Pauline, thanks very much for coming on the show again. Thank you so much for having me. All right, listeners, that's it. Thanks very much for tuning in again. You can also catch me on War for Idiots where myself and co-host uh, Richie uh, take a really, really, really simple look at some uh, complex uh, concepts such as the cities, which we've done in the past. And we try and make it a little bit more fun and a little bit more humorous. Um, although I find that I'm funny on both shows, whereas Richie's funny on neither. <laughs> but listeners, until next time, <laughs> grab a book and crack on. Join the conversation with us on Twitter at Dead Prussian Pod, on Facebook at The Dead Prussian Page, or on our website, www.thedeadprussian.com. All show notes for this episode, as well as copyright information, can be found on the website. The Dead Prussian podcast is written, produced and hosted by Mick Cook. It is co-produced by Amanda Levito. The music used throughout is Caught in the Beat by Broke for Free and is used under a Creative Commons attribution licence. All opinions expressed by individuals on the podcast are those of the individual and not necessarily representative of any other organisation.